Let's look at verse 5. And upon her forehead, so what's on her forehead? Was a name written. So just like Satan, she's going to follow Satan and she's going to follow the Antichrist in having a name of blasphemy. What's on it? Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. <laughs> that's strong. That's pretty strong. So that's on her forehead. That's the name that's written. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Okay, so we can interpret this over here. First of all, it's known as a what? Mystery. Is that correct? All right. So when we look at Babylon over here, we're going to look at all these other factors that pop out concerning Babylon. It's first known as mystery. Why? Because it's not going to be plain in sight. It's going to be hidden. It's going to be a conspiracy. Oops, I just said that. It's going to be undercover. That's good. It's not really well known. And it is no secret that all the world knows that in Vatican Library, they hold a lot of secrets that the world don't know about. Mm -hmm. Not only that, you just look at history, and even today, and even the Inquisition, you got to realize during the Inquisition, Vatican held its secret for a long time in the library. Yeah. So then the History Channel later came out that they kept a secret all this time, but then finally in the modern century, they let out the information. And once they let out the information of the Inquisition, it was very horrifying. But trust me, that's only a part of their library that they showed you about the Inquisition. They didn't tell you a lot more other stuff. The Roman Catholic Church, it was behind the dealings of World War II, uh, the rise of Islam and communism, uh, and the Rothschilds starting with the Illuminati, and then what went on with Napoleon Bonaparte, where he changed literally the empire system through him. And then you got all the founders of the, uh, all the big heads of the globalists today. You got to realize all of that is, uh, I mentioned in a lot of other videos that I showed you concerning about prophecy conspiracies, you're going to find something Catholic, which is very disturbing. Yeah, amen. So it's easy where people can point out Jew, Jew, Jew in every, uh, behind every conspiracy theory. But see, that's the, that's the cleverness of the Catholic Church system, is that they're the hidden bad guys, and then they can make the Jewish bankers as the plain-to-see bad guys. That's the thing. It's very, very hidden. Very, very hidden. You notice the way that their building is structured that just matches with, you know, our capital today, and then even at Jerusalem itself, a lot of theirs, they have a lot of symbols for some strange reason, right? The Catholic Church, they have a lot of symbols. And one of their symbols somewhere is going to match up with what you see at a Masonic Lodge or a Mormon temple. Mm -hmm. Very strange where they have these oaths, the Jesuits. It just seems to match so much with the Masonic oath. Yeah. A lot of things you, uh, you didn't know about, but that's the mystery. So that's why it's known as mystery. Another interesting thing is you notice that God called it mystery. That's why he doesn't mention it a lot in your Bible. When he talks about the evil system of the Antichrist in reference to Rome, he mentions it so many times like some sort of mystery. Mystery, something hidden. Why? Because it's something where the Lord doesn't want to give it the time of day with. He wants people to know about his kingdom, his word, his system, plain sight. He wants all the world to know that. But with evil... He doesn't want people to stick their head in there. And that's the trouble with, uh, you got to watch out with onliners is that, look, some of this uncovering, yes, it's good for awareness, yeah. but you don't want to stick your head in the muck. That's right. You just want to look enough that you know the muck is there, but you don't want to stick in there. And not only that, investigate it deeper Amen. where you smell too now like them. Amen. That's good. All right, let's look at a couple more things concerning here. It says Babylon the Great. All right, the word Babylon, we uh, claim that this is referring to the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, why do you say that? Because historically, if you study about Babylon, it started with Nimrod. That's found in your Bible. Ba uh, Nimrod Semiramis undoubtedly started, they were way before the Roman Catholic Church. Nimrod and Semiramis uh, did their religious workings about the sun god, worshiping the sun god, the wafer, where some deity went inside it and they were eating it. 
And, uh, you know, the Christmas day is referring to the reincarnation of Nimrod. All of that was carried on later on by the Roman Catholic Church claiming Jesus' birthday is December 25th, Christmas Day, and where they make a big deal about a woman holding a baby in her arms, Mary and Jesus. Uh, no, if you go back to Nimrod's history, that's referring to Semiramis and Tammuz. All these halos around these idols' head, you notice that? That was from the sun god worship system from, Nem uh, from Nimrod and Semiramis. So I would highly recommend David W. Daniel's work. David W. Daniel's work. Uh, I think it's called uh, uh, Mystery Babylon. But go to Chick Publications and then you should find that easily. It's all comic book, by the way. It's not dry and dull. Everything is picture for our TV generation, so it's like a story. But he, what's so brilliant is that he puts every footnote and docu yeah. historical document, documentation with a, within a character who's speaking out. So let's say Nimrod is speaking out over here, like, I am God, right? That, he'll put a footnote on that, and he'll put a historical source underneath that. Wow. Yeah, so it's really fun. I would highly recommend to read that. Okay, so we know that. And it's called The Great, obviously. Why? Because this is, ref as, this is like a title. Our church is great. The Pope is great. The system is great. The great, it's, re it's referring to its magnitude. And there is no doubt when you look at the building structure, as soon as you walk, walk inside, the, this word is going to pop out in your mind when you look at that. Mm -hmm. I mean, as soon as you, I mean, the building is, I mean, look, hellish the system is, they've got real spectacular, beautiful buildings. Yeah. Okay, the architecture, design, the art, everything. I mean, you might, uh, you might think it's a monkey circus where they're doing the, Roman Catholic ceremony, but there is something austere and beautiful in the lost man human's yeah. mind about the ceremony and everything. Yeah. It's great. All right, another thing over here, the mother, so that's no doubt. So look, what religion keeps saying mother church, mother church, mother, mother, and they make a big deal about the mother more than the child? So the Roman Catholic Church with their Mary with their mother church, and etc. Mother. What religion makes a big deal about the mother? I mean, Islam, they might have a mother figure or something like that. Um, a, lo a lot of them might disagree. Some of them might agree with that. But the thing is, is that uh, they more prioritize Allah and Muhammad. Yeah, there's no system that goes like really mother mode over here. Another one is of harlots and abominations of the earth. And that's plain as day. That's referring to that uh, conglomeration. That's a conglomeration with different bodies of nations, right? So which system has, an, uh, uh, has this conglomeration or compromise or this unity, um, ecumenical movement, so to speak? Who's one of the biggest champions on that in a religious plane? Or makes dealings with politics, politicians, governors, presidents, etc. Who does that? So it just screams, you notice over here, it just screams plainly that the best candidate is the Roman Catholic Church, if you're going to find out historically and today. All right, let's look at verse 6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So notice here, that's why you notice in this picture, this woman who's holding the cup, there's blood dripping out. That's why I mentioned pers she's, the Roman Catholic Church system is the best candidate due to persecution. Because there has to be a system that carried on the blood of God's people. Notice right here the blood of saints with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. I mean, what book is plainly titled Fox's Book of Martyrs? You know what that whole book was about? It's plainly titled Martyrs. It was all about the Roman system. All about Rome. It didn't talk about communism or uh, the pagan nations as much. It was referring to, it was mostly concentrating on Rome. Roman system. Martyrs mirror, thick book. Thick book. A lot of it where our Baptist heritage, heritage came from, they got hit the worst, actually. And these guys, all persecuted by Roman system. 
that they make up the majority of martyrs throughout history. Not only that, um, it says the blood of the saints, right, at verse 6. So notice that they're going to continue on their persecution of tribulation saints as well. Now look, if you're going to think of a system ever since the timeline of John, so John's writing this, right? Ever since the timeline of John, all the way throughout history, what's the best candidate in system? It's a Roman system. Amen. It's that Roman system. From secular, uh, from pagan secular power during the early 80s to that religious power during, uh, during the time throughout history. All right, let's continue reading over here. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So notice that when John saw her, he was what? He was, in, he was in wonder. Great what? Admiration. See, this really was like a whoa moment for him. Uh, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, sometimes when I, uh, here's an example. When I talk about some kind of mystery, some hidden conspiracy that a lot of people didn't think about before and then I revealed it, you notice sometimes that uh, your pastor has this wonder or the people in the room are in wonder. They're like, whoa, I didn't know that, know that, right? What does that mean? See, that's the same reaction. See, John is seeing, verse 5, a mystery here, right? Like the conspiracy, right? Like how people react to mysteries and conspiracies, something hidden, right? Hidden agendas. See, John, it was like a wow moment for him that he's like, whoa, I didn't see that before. Why? Because, see, he's living in that time of Rome. So that's why it becomes really eye-opening to him later on. Verse 7, And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? <laughs> Notice that the angel up in heaven said, Why is this something to be shocked about, right? Marvel, like wonder, like whoa moment. You know why? Because the angels up in heaven and God, they already seen it for the past, what? All the past 6,000 years of human history. They saw this spiritual Babylon working ever since from Nimrod and entering through the Roman system, which went from pagan Rome into religious Roman Catholic Rome. So the angels saw it all this time. So to him, it's not a wonder. But to us humans, it is, right? It is, right? Like, let me give you another wow moment, for example, okay, concerning about Rome. If you look at the big guys today concerning about uh, the coronavirus, let's say Fauci, let's say Governor Gavin, and then uh, let's talk about Cuomo and then et cetera, et cetera. Didn't you know all these guys came from Catholic institutions? That's their educational background. Oh, I didn't see that before. All right, so that's one small example, okay? Imagine if John saw like all of this, right? But see, to God, that's not like a whoa moment. He's like, I saw this a long time ago, Amen. you know? Let's keep reading over here. The first part of verse 7, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman. Ah, so he's going to tell him this mystery. He's going to expose this mystery, what this woman is. And of the beast that carrieth her. He's going to expose the mystery of this beast right over here. Uh, this beast that carried her, which hath the what? Seven heads and ten horns. So this is referring to Satan. We know this is the Roman Catholic Church. But let's see some more things in this mystery that you didn't know about. Wouldn't this be a great time to close Bible study, right? Yeah. All right, let's look at this, all right? This is going to be really, this is going to be your whoa moment, right? Like John in great wonder. You might go, whoa, like that, okay? So here we go. Verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. All right, I'll break that down one by one later on, but let's look at this first phrase here. If you are there in our Revelation verse-by-verse -verse Bible study, you can obviously guess what this phrase would be re referring to, right? You would be thinking Antichrist, right? Yeah, because I mentioned to you before about Revelation 11 is, was not, comes out of the bottomless, uh, comes out of perdition. I mentioned all of that to you at Revelation 11 Bible study that that was the Antichrist. I mentioned to you at Revelation 13, the Antichrist is called the beast, the beast, the beast, correct? Okay, so we already know that. Now, this seems to be a little bit confusing here because uh, the angel is explaining to him the beast at verse 7, right? The verse 7, the, the animal with uh, seven heads and ten horns, correct? We identify this being not as the Antichrist, but as what? Satan at Revelation 12. 
Why not the Antichrist? Because you notice that uh, distinction when we looked at Revelation chapter 13. See, when we look at Revelation chapter 13, the distinction over here is that this beast, seven head, ten horns, and upon his horns, what? Ten crowns, correct? That's distinguished from Revelation 12, actually. Revelation 12, verse 3, if you want to repeat that, Seven head, ten horns, and seven what? Crowns upon his head. See, there's a distinction. The Revelation 12 beast is not the same as the Revelation 13 beast. The Revelation 13 beast is the Antichrist, and I'm not going to expound on that. I explained it to you last time. Revelation 12 is Satan, and I'm not going to expound on that. I explained it to you last time. But here's another thing. Another thing is that this beast is what kind of color at verse 4? Uh, not verse 4, it is verse 3. It's scarlet colored, right? It's red. The Antichrist, if you look at Revelation 13, he's not, he's not a red animal. He's, he's like a chimera, you know. He comes out with a uh, leopard's body, but then what he has is the feet of the bear and the mouth of a lion. Remember that at Revelation 13? And remember Revelation 12, we read it, it says, what kind of a dragon? Red dragon, yes, correct. Great red dragon, see that? Okay, so then, is there a contradiction in Scripture? Oh, I just love it when <laughs> some people think that there's a contradiction in yeah. Scripture. That means there's an even deeper revelation, more eye-opening moment. So the idea is this. We know for a fact, okay, the first, let's look at verse 8. The beast, we know for a fact that has to be Satan, right? Why? Because we already looked at uh, we already looked at the scarlet color at verse 3, which matches with Revelation 12, right? Okay, so we already know that. But then we know this next part of the phrase, that thou sawest was, is not, shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. We know that's the Antichrist. How can there be two in one over here? Oh, bingo, you got it. What? You just confused me, Pastor. You saw two in one here, Satan and Antichrist in one. Uh -huh. What does God have with his trinity? Godhead. Yes, he has the Godhead over here where Father, Son, Holy Ghost is what? One. Amen. Jesus Christ, Christ, Jesus Christ, Satan imitates that with what? Antichrist. But Jesus is what? God incarnate. That's why they're still one and the same God. But the Antichrist, see, that's why Satan's going to have his trinity. This Antichrist over here is, imitate, is a copycat of what? Jesus Christ. That's why he's called Antichrist. Amen. Because he's trying to imitate Jesus Christ. And what, what is he? Satan incarnate. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. Amen. So that's why it's like two in one over here. So what's going on is that what this is, is that this is the Antichrist is Satan incarnate. So it makes sense when you look at Revelation 13, they, the verses, they worship the Antichrist, right? But who do they also worship, if you read that same passage? The dragon. Why? It's Satan incarnate. It's Satan incarnate. That's good. All right, then. Hey, it gets better, brother. It gets better. Ready? Oh, it gets more fun, all right? No, all right. <laughs> let's close it, right? There we go, all right? All right, so I am not going to explain... Uh, the, the phrase in verse 8, that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. I'm not going to uh, go through verse by verse on that one. I already did last time, right? Yeah. But let me just give a simple explanation for that one. The beast that the, the Antichrist, right, or Satan incarnate that you saw was, see, past tense, and is not, he's currently not there and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Future, he's going to come out of hell, the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. He's going to perdition. Okay, so what's going on over here is that the Antichrist is that, why does it go past, present, and future, right? It seems to go at a past tense where he was in existence as reigning, a present tense where he's not in existence and he went to hell, present tense, and then a future tense that he's going to come out again and continue ruling. Wait a minute. Okay, so then, past existence, present existence is in hell, 
he's going to come up out again but to, and continue his future existence. That sounds like what? He, he used to exist. He died. Pre uh, in his presence existence, he went down to hell. But futurely, he's going to come back out of hell and continue his life of reigning. See? You notice that? That's the idea. Now, uh, let me show you even something even... Okay, so th if that, that's one, but let me tell you another one, which is even more fun, okay? So then the Antichrist, we know that this is going to be referring to... Now, me, I believe, I mentioned to you be before that I believe that the Antichrist is going to be the Pope. That seems to be the best candidate. And uh, I'm not going to expound that here. If people are critical of that, just before you criticize, watch my previous Revelation uh, Bible studies. Look at Revelation 6 and Revelation 13. But not only that, if she is the Roman Catholic Church and writing what? Satan incarnate, the Antichrist. I mean, they're sharing the same system here, right? So Roman Catholic is the best. So that's why I really believe over here that the Pope is going to be the Antichrist. Now, I know when you look at Pope Francis, he really doesn't look like the one who will rule over all the world, okay? Because me, I have to agree with that too. That's why it's going to be a, what's going to happen is this. The coronavirus is already changing a lot of things. You can have a, uh, so what's going to happen with the Roman Catholic system, if it's going to rule over all the world, it has to, ha has to change into a different system. Can it change? Well, that's a dumb question. <laughs> have you looked at the past less than 50 years of the Roman Catholic Church? They changed a lot. They changed incredibly a lot, especially Pope Francis. He did uh, one of the most dramatic changes, with, like Pope John Paul would. He did incredible dramatic changes. That a lot of liberals, if you go to them in schools, believe it or not, there are a good number of them that lo like this new pope. Yeah. Yeah. So the Catholic Church can change. It can morph. It can adapt incredibly. you got to understand. Okay, so now let's look at Revelation chapter 17. So we see over here, that the anti uh, so this is the Antichrist. He died, buried, and resurrected. Great, great imitation of what? You notice. He has to imitate Jesus Christ over here. This is such a great imitation of Jesus Christ. So the Antichrist, he holds a bow, you might recall. He is holding a bow, but it has no arrows. Why? Uh, because it's not a weapon that... It, that plainly shows violence and hurt, it, he's doing peace. See? But you notice that peace is like a what? What weapon you use for peace? It's like a bow. How are you using a bow? That's why the Bible specifically says bow. Because he has to come in peace. But it actually, it's like that passive aggressiveness. See? It's that passive aggression. See? Like, Bible says peace, but it would be what? Sudden destruction. 1 Thessalonians 5.